Okay. Um, A mí me salió, María Paz, que el ancho de banda de Kathleen es muy bajo. Uh, si hablo así, ¿sería mejor? Sí, se escucha bien. Se escucha bien. Eh, no, no sé dónde sale eso. Es, sí, no sé cómo ves eso. Uh, ¿Se oye bien o se oye mal? Es muy se bajo. oye bien. Se oye bien. Se oye bien. Okay. Sí, se oye bien. Sí, una vez que comencemos, once we start, I'm going to ask everyone to put the cameras off and the microphones off. So just you speaking. Okay. And even you without the camera uh, could be better. But, but we won't start it. So for now, yeah. it's good that people can see you before the, okay. the, the meeting. Okay? Okay. <sighs> And um, Maria, I did send the uh, the presentation. That <laughs> I had to send it in Google Drive, and I don't know if you have Google Drive. Oh, we're going to ask Igor. Igor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, super. But hopefully it'll work from from my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, just yesterday, yesterday was good as so I yeah. think everything is going to be fine. We need to be careful with the microphones and videos from the <laughs> rest of the people in the room, but I think it's going to be okay. It's still amazing I mean, that I'm in Virginia and you are in Chile and Santiago. Yeah. And it's like you're next door. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was wondering when I asked you if the time, the difference between Chile and the part of the of US where you are is going to be a difficult because so maybe too many hours of difference, but we have the same time. It's the same time. Yeah. Yeah, same. Because we're on um, daylight savings time. It's mm -hmm. in the summer. We, yeah. we move one hour ahead. So in, in the winter, then you are... We, hour, we are now in winter time. You're in winter. So when it's winter, so when you're in summer, we're the same time. And when you're in winter, then you're two hours different. <laughs> really, we are in autumn, but the, uh, the change in the, um, in the clock is already like we were in in winter so we okay. we changed the um, the clock like one month ago or uh -huh. i don't remember how many days ago but we have a different clock time now like yeah one month ago we moved our clocks the other direction so spring spring forward Uh, hi, Kathleen. Maybe you can share screen just for a test, or if you want. Yeah. Let's yeah, share. Oh, let me open the. I have to. Let me open the presentation. Share screen. But it, oh. it is almost a starting. Okay. There you go. Good. Okay, yeah, my my internet says it's unstable, which 
is not unusual. So we don't have very good internet here. So can you see it? Yes, I can see your presentation. Okay. Do you want the other slides first? Sorry? Do you want those other first? Do you want those other slides first? There's other slides antes de este. Oh, we already put it. Okay. Before you started, we put the um, the slide with the um, indications for the lecture. So we're yeah, ready. I saw. It. Okay. Hi, Maria Paz. Hi, Dr. Trandall. Hello. Hola, Benja. Hola. Hola, Pau. ¿Cómo estuvo el cumpleaños? Fantástico. Muy bueno. Ah, Adiós, pero qué buena respuesta. Muéstranos tu carita para que Kathleen te conozca. O no sé si ya se conoce. ¿Se ve? Sí, sí está. Ay, no, we've never no, met, Dr. Crandall. Thanks for taking part in this. It's very nice of you. I know uh, who you are. It's my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. This is wonderful because Benjamin is in the south of Chile now. You are so far away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are here in Santiago and this is perfect. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a nice thing about this damn pandemic that the amount of uh, open lectures that uh, that are out yeah. there is is great. I mean, oh. Yeah, kept Absolutely. people's hopes up. I mean, people's morale up. Yeah, makes it an easy way to share information. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm 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 convinced that it really helps keep spirits up. Yeah, and I, I at least uh, also helps with your mind focus in something else that yeah. pandemic <laughs> information. Exactly. And I think that that's healthy. Yeah. Talk so about quarantine something else. The movement restriction doesn't doesn't mm. play doesn't play good for uh, for our mind either. So these lectures are great for that. Yeah. And see, the mustache of Benjamin is... Uh... Oh, so the mustache of Benjamin is, is the best. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> it cheers us all during the... Shut up. Oh, you, oh, you don't, because Dr. Crandall doesn't know me. <laughs> it's we it's started, a new thing. We and started, they make fun of me every day. <laughs> we started this, this round of uh, talks without Benjamin mustache. Oh. And now we have mustache. every... Week seeing the growing of the mustache. <laughs> He's been changing every every, every day. <laughs> so that tells you how long this has been going on, because that's quite a mustache. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's been a while. My I can't say that my wife is very happy with it, but oh well. Well. <laughs> well, the last lecture we're going to close this uh, lecture marathon with uh, with a lecture of Benjamin telling people how to take good care of the most time. <laughs> 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 yeah. A different kind of lecture. Yeah. Exactly. It will be wonderful. We're nearly there, isn't it? Six o'clock already? Mm -hmm. Yes, two minutes. Cool, two I'm gonna minutes. turn off my camera. Um, take care, everybody. It's nice to meet you, Benjamin. Same here. So Kathleen, I'm just going to close my camera and I'm okay. going to start to present you, but as we spoke yesterday in Spanish, so everyone can understand your resume and know you better. And then you start with the talk. Uh, if you prefer, you want, if you, you prefer your camera on, you can do it or you can put your camera off and just, uh, and just speak. Talk. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So bye bye and I see you later. Anything that we um, could notice during the lectures uh, on your um, on your speed of talking or anything on, on the screen, I will let you know. I, I'm going to put my um, Put your camera back micro, on. My, my, my microphone on and I'm going to speak to you, okay? okay. To let you know if anything is going wrong.
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully not, but <laughs> we're going to be aware of that. Okay. Okay. Ahora les voy a hablar a todos los presentes en beneficio de aquellos que puedan entender un poco menos el, el inglés. Voy a presentarles a la doctora Grandel en español. Lo conversa. Ella entiende bastante español, pero en beneficio de eh, el, la fluidez de la charla, eh, decidimos que la hiciera en inglés. Ella ha venido a nuestro país eh, en otras oportunidades para participar en las eh, jornadas de HV. Ella es médico veterinario eh, que obtuvo además su magíster en ciencias en eh, nutrición equina y fisi fisiología del ejercicio y su PhD también en la Universidad de Virginia Tech. Eh, y, esa, y ella ha sido ahí además eh, superintendente del de Centro de Estudios de Agricultura y Extensión de la Universidad de Virginia Tech donde también está a cargo de un centro de estudio e investigación en cuanto a eh, nutrición equina y eh, reproducción equina. Los últimos 23 años, ella ha sido un consultor para el Kentucky Equine Research, del cual es miembro, ¿cierto? Y es un representante de esta institución. Eh, prestando soporte, tanto nacional o internacional, a los programas que implementa el, el CARE eh, y a toda la eh, colaboración que entrega desde el punto de vista ya sea de planes nutricionales y los alimentos y suplementos que ellos mismos formulan. Por lo tanto, ella tiene relación directa tanto con los consumidores como con los médicos veterinarios y las empresas. Se involucra en todo el proceso. Además, ella es instructora de la Universidad de Guelph, en Ontario, Canadá. Eh, tiene un programa online de nutrición equina avanzado y además eh, otro estudio más profundo sobre enfermedades y otros desórdenes asociados a la nutrición equina. Ella recibió tres veces el premio eh, John H. Daniel Fellowship del de, eh, National Sporting Library en Virginia. Eh, sobre, para desarrollar estudios eh, sobre la nutrición equina, suplementación y la laminitis, que también ha sido uno de sus focos de investigación. Y además de eso, de sus actividades como médico veterinario y dedicada a la nutrición equina, es también eh, jinete, de jinete de endurance y de prueba completa desde el año 89, así que hoy día sigue manteniéndose activa, tiene tres caballos árabes que la acompañan siempre en sus actividades ecuestres. So thank you, Kathleen, for being here and collaborate with us again, as usual. You are amazing with us. So now the lecture is all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Maria Paz, for the kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be joining you on the other end of the world. Uh, uh, it's um, uh, just a strange time for all of us I'm with the, all these COVID restrictions. So I think we're just very fortunate to be able to do something like this, these, I call them Zoominars. Um, and I can present all this information to you, even though you're miles, miles, miles away. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera. I think because I don't have the best um, internet here. And so maybe that'll help. Um, uh, stabilize the, the signal. So, uh, so let me go ahead and get started. So uh, what I uh, was thought to talk about and was asked to, we discussed talking about was the, the different strategies for uh, meeting the different dietary needs of the different types of horses. So, um, so it's just that sound nutrition is, um, is important important and in order to, to do sound nutrition in the horse, um, you need to have all of the proper nutrients in the right amounts and that will meet the specific physiological needs of the animal. Um, so the nutrients just in general uh, uh, fall into six categories, uh, one being water and that being of course the most important, uh, but the other ones are carbohydrates, 
fats, proteins, minerals, and vitamins. So those nutrients all work together to support the physiological efforts of the animal. Um, but some of those nutrients are uh, involved in the energy, uh, the use of energy in the horse. So I, I like to think of um, a good balance would be the number of calories going into the horse uh, equal the amount of calories that the horse is using, so going out. So uh, when, you, when it's out of balance and you have too many calories going in and not enough going out, then you get uh, weight gain. And if you have too many going out and not enough going in, then the horse will be losing weight. And so in order to meet those energy needs, uh, the animal can use different sources in the diet. And so those sources are things like carbohydrates. Uh, there's two very distinctive uh, types of nutrients. So the structural carbohydrate, which are your, are your fibers, and then non-structural carbohydrates, which are your and sugars. Uh, another energy source is the fat in the diet, which is mainly like from oils and things like that. And then another energy source can be protein. It's when excess protein is broken down part of that molecule can be used for energy, but the rest of the molecule has to be um, gotten rid of. But it's not a very efficient uh, energy source and it's sort of the last ditch um, energy source that the horse would be using uh, in his diet. We, we tend in, in the United States, we can measure uh, energy source, horse nutrition, it's digestible energy in other parts of the world. They use things like um, mega joules and, and sometimes net energy, but usually talk about digestible energy. So just focusing a little bit on the carbohydrates themselves, because that's the most important of the energy nutrients uh, for energy. Structural carbohydrates, and these are um, structural because they are actually the carbohydrates in this cell wall. So if you look at the picture around the edges of these cells, that's where you're finding this cellulose and the hemicellulose and uh, that the horse um, can utilize for energy. And the feeds that are high, high uh, in cell wall in these fiber carbohydrates uh, are forages, roughages, and some of the high fiber byproducts that uh, are from the food industry. And then inside the cell here uh, are the non-structural carbohydrates. So we find our sugars and our starches. We even find our storage carbohydrate called fructans uh, within inside the cell. Uh, so feeds that would be high in these uh, Structural carbohydrates are things like the cereal grains, uh, sugars, molasses, uh, even lush grass, fresh green grass can be pretty high in uh, sugars and, and fructans. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Kathleen. Most of the the yes. time yes <laughs> in some points you get a little slower but the most of the time it's okay okay that's my my internet <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry about that but <laughs> uh so if we looked at these different carbohydrates and where they're digested in the in the um in the horse and then how they get used for energy in the horse we can see there are non-structural carbohydrates the cereal grains this and then uh, they enter into the bloodstream in the form of glucose and glucose gets used for energy for the horse. If we look at our structural carbohydrates, the forages, the high fiber feeds, they are um, fermented in the hindgut um, and these microbes that do the fermentation, they release, they break it down to short chain fatty acids, which are absorbed into the bloodstream and then used by the horse for energy. 
And if we looked at our other energy, energy source fats, uh, like what you find in oils and some high fat seeds, we see it's digested also in the small intestine. And uh, then it enters into the bloodstream in the form of fatty acids and triglycerides. And so why this is important is because uh, we can manipulate the, the amount of the structural and non-structural and fats in the diet to provide more some of these substrates than others if we're dealing with certain types of, of work or if we're dealing with certain um, metabolic problems that the horse might have. So the structural carbohydrates, the horse doesn't billions and billions of microbes uh, that break it down uh, into small pieces and the short chain fatty acids uh, through the process of fermentation. And it's those, once it's broken those down into those small pieces, then it can enter into the bloodstream. So, uh, amazing about this uh, energy is that those microbes don't, um, they don't go to sleep. They're always sort of working those celluloses and hemicelluloses and, and breaking them down. And then, so that energy is released constantly into the bloodstream. So it's, it's it may not be a rapid energy source, but it's one. Um, also, because you, the horse is depending on those microbes uh, for that energy generation, it's really important that they're, um, that they're happy and they're functioning well. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about those microbes and the microbiota in the, in, um, the horse is uh, that not only do they, they produce energy for the horse, but they also uh, are responsible for the health of the lining digestive tract. Um, some of the certain types of microbes, uh, they, they enact the, the lining and they block pathogenic uh, microbes from, from um, getting uh, to the actual lining itself. And they also produce, um, butyrate is also fuel for the, the cells of the intestinal tract. So the, the microbes also um, are are invaluable to the horse because the majority of the horse's immune system is in the digestive tract and that's because of those microbes. They've also found that there's a, a, a link to between those microbes in the digestive tract and the brain. They communicate. It's called the gut-brain access and there's some amazing research going on with how the microbes might be affecting some of our um, problems that we have, uh, like autism in, in human beings. So, and then the thing that the microbiota has been found to be responsible for is gene expression. So they go a lot farther than, than just breaking down the fibers for the horse. So uh, fortunately, um, the, the natural diet of the horse forage is the natural substrate for those microbes. So uh, you're wanting to do whatever you can to make them happy. And so you, that's why we base the diet of the horse and forage. And um, that's why we recommend that the diet should be at least 50% um, forage. So the forage keeps those that my, those microbes happy uh, and um, produce energy, but they also, in the forage, certain aspect of forage itself that uh, that is uh, also important to the nutrition of the animal. For uh, example, the forage provides other essential nutrients like vitamins and minerals. Uh, the uh, when a horse is eating forage, uh, it provides bulk in, in the diet, in the digestive tract, and that bulk will help keep that digestive tract functioning properly. It keeps the digestive moving through on uh, through the digestive tract because the worst thing is for it to stagnate. Uh, it also, uh, when there's fiber present in the, in the hindgut, it stimulates thirst. 
And so uh, you, if you gave a horse a meal of hay within two hours, he's gonna take a drink. I see there's a link there. Uh, it also can work as a reservoir of water and electrolytes. Fiber holds water and some of the essential um, minerals like um, sodium and chloride. The other thing is also important for, uh, for the horses. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, for enough to make them have to chew a lot so it satisfies that need. Uh, the other thing is because they're chewing so much, <clears throat> excuse me, chewing so much that they, uh, there's a buffer in the saliva that when they swallow uh, that buffer hits the stomach and so if they're eating a lot of forage it can help to reduce the risk of gastric ulcers. It also is a uh, those abnormal stereotypic years. <clears throat> now, I know I said previously 50%, but for me personally, I don't like to see that less than 75%. Fortunately, that more optimal for a healthier digestive tract. So what happens when um, those microbes get out of balance? Well, you get uh, inflammation in the body is what happens. Um, it's because you have a, a normal balance of some uh, ben of the beneficial microbes and uh, the uh, pathogenic microbes are, are all present. Um, and uh, it's these beneficial ones that sort of line and uh, the the digest a track and keep those pathogen ones safe. And uh, so if something causes these beneficial ones to get out of balance or to die off, then you get uh, the, the uh, pathogen bacteria can start to get actually to the, uh, the lining itself and then they can work their way through the tight junctions of the of the the cells and then they can enter in bloodstream and uh, going to get inflammatory response because you're getting these pathogenic uh, microbes entering into the cell and then you get the body and inflammation so that's that's sort of explains how um how important it is to keep those microbes happy uh some of the signs are out um, it's just maybe the horse just isn't doing well. Uh, maybe lose newer, um, be really gassy, or maybe even as bad as diarrhea. Uh, the horse may have difficulty um, keeping weight, maybe losing weight. Some of them can get really picky about what they're eating because their stomach just doesn't feel well. Uh, some horses are uh, prone to colic, or they might have. Uh, little mini colics, little mild colics, uh, chronically. Sometimes you'll see horses uh, chewing wood or dirt or manure. Uh, this is called pica, but uh, it can be from the spots, it could be from the as well, but that's one of the signs that may be an imbalance in there. Um, when horses get cinchy and uh, touchy about to um, touching them and uh, but also uh, maybe they're just cranky and kicking at stalls or biting at their flanks uh, maybe they're hard to saddle uh, they don't like being brushed they don't like being uh, cinched up uh, uh, it's because their stomach doesn't feel well or they may have low energy and depressed be depressed or they could be high strung and anxious and nervous behaviors So what causes um, dysbiosis? Well, disease would be one, but uh, abrupt changes in uh, stress, uh, illness, uh, travel, because that sort of disrupts their normal eating schedule and, uh, and stresses them. Uh, even dehydration can, can cause dysbiosis. Uh, if there's too much starch or sugar in the diet and it starts influencing which of the microbes 
thrive and which ones die off, uh, then that can cause a, a dis, an imbalance, a dysbiosis. Uh, if there's mold or contaminated feed or hay can cause problems. So the key to, is just to keep uh, lots of uh, clean, um, good quality fiber going into the horse. So different uh, sources of fiber are the forages, hay, um, and Kathleen? things like halid. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I want to propose you something. Okay. Uh, let's try that we manage the presentation and you just talk because at some point you start to get slow, slow, slow. Oh, and I get ahead of the presentation. And no, you, you, your, um, your speaking, uh, it, it is slower than in other parts. So we miss you, and it, the most important thing is not missing you. So, what do you think about we manage the um, the slides and okay. you just talk? Okay. Okay. Try. Um, okay. Let's stop. Okay. I will let you. I will let you know. Okay. Um, we were, I think, in this slide. Let me try. You just. I'm gonna put the presentation. You just say to me next, next, and I'm gonna be. You're gonna be my boss. Okay. Okay. All right. So, yes. So we are on the next you slide. See, you see the presentation? Yes. So the next slide. Okay. So um, does it go into uh, slideshow mode? Can you do that? I'm going to. Yeah, down there. Yeah. Uh -huh. There you okay. go. Okay. All right. So uh, if we just look, we're looking at forages, and so you just want to know, well, what what are the benefits uh, and and um, problems with certain types of hay? Uh, the major, the two major types are grass hay and legume hay. Should I turn my um, screen off, Maria Paz? Let's do that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, stop video. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, okay. So the uh, grass haze, there's things like orchard grass and um, Bermuda and Timothy. Uh, they're uh, probably the better better choice for horses when it look when you look at the nutrients, the protein is more in line with the requirements of the average horse, and the calcium phosphorus is uh, closer to their requirements and the energy levels seem to be pretty pretty close to the they can eat a lot chew a lot and yet not gain too much weight uh the you, the uh, mixing mixed grass so grass with like alfalfa is also a really good good option uh, particularly for horses that ha have a harder time putting weight on uh, but i understand that in um, chile that alfalfa is is pretty much what is available. I mean, there's not as much of the grass hay available. And so that's what the horses are being fed. And it's a good, it's actually a very good forage for horses, but it has a few problems like being pretty high in, uh, in protein and pretty, pretty high in calcium, at least higher than grass hay. And uh, is pretty high in energy, so these horses can gain a lot of weight with with um, when they're eating alfalfa. Uh, the other problem is the enteroliths. Uh, alfalfa is prone in certain from certain areas um, it can cause uh, enterolith formation, but it, it is a good, particularly a good type of a hay for. Uh, Brood mares and growing horses and, and hard keeping horses are really hard working horses. Okay, so next slide. So um, Maria Paz mentioned that uh, uh, that the use of haylage um, is 
is, is available to you, but it's not as common. And so you have, there are some questions and some, wor pre, some worries about, about using it. Uh, haylage is when uh, the grass is cut and then it's, let, uh, it's allowed to wilt and dry to a moisture content of about 40 to 45%. Now, if you were making hay, then it would be dried to 20, uh, 10 to 20%. So it's, so it's a little higher moisture. So then it's sealed into bags of some type of sort. And this, uh, this encloses it, the, the, the forage, um, with enough moisture so that it can undergo some type of fermentation. And, and that helps to preserve the forage. And it, it actually retains about 90% of, of the feed value of fresh grass when, when it's made properly. So it's, a, it's, it's, a really, it's actually a good option for, for horses, um, they, particularly horses that have problems with dust allergies or something like COPD, uh, respiratory problems like COPD. Uh, it's because it's very, very low dust and low mold. Um, that being said, uh, that's if it's made correctly, okay? So uh, the thing about this is that, that haylage, because it has a higher water content, um, it also, and because it's been preserved at a higher um, quality than, uh, than hay would be, that it has a higher nutritional value. So maybe about 10% higher energy than, than hay. Uh, it, horses, once they acquire a taste for haylage, they really tend to like it. It's pretty, it's pretty palatable. Uh, the, the other thing is that they, because of the higher water content, they seem to fill up, uh, fill up more. I, I don't know how to say this. So these, they'll, they'll appear to be eating, um, if you weighed it out, it, they appear to be eating less, but um, it's because of the water content. So some of the things that you need to be careful when, with eating it, because what, when it's sealed, it becomes um, anaerobic. And uh, if there's any puncture or anything in that bag when it's supposed to be sealed, then air can get in. And so uh, the forage right around where that puncture is, um, I don't recommend feeding that that forage. I usually try to get rid of that uh, and uh, to just just in case. The, um, the other thing is once you've opened up one of these bales that you really, once it's Close to air, it really, um, and it's a higher moisture content, it can start developing molds. And so they really need to be used pretty quickly. Uh, the, uh, like one of the small commercial bales um, really needs to be used within seven days. Uh, also because it's been ensiled and it's um, been fermented, uh, that uh, if you just put a horse on it uh, rapidly and change, change your diet, diet quickly, you can get some digestive upset. So the idea is you, it's best to introduce small amounts and then gradually work up to the amount that you're going to be feeding. So those are just some of the, the quirks to, to about haylage. Okay, uh, slide. So there are also some other uh, fiber sources that we you can use in, in horses. Most of them are byproducts um, of the human food industry, uh, like beet pulp, which is what's left over after they squeeze the sugar out of a sugar beet. And then soybean hulls are something that's that's the skin of the soybean. So they use the soybean for for making oil or for um, for for eating, but they, the when they do the when they make use the soybean for oil, then they remove the hulls, and then uh, it um, it itself is a, is a very good fiber source. And and alfalfa meal also is a good um, fiber. We consider it like one of our super fibers. And they are uh, usually higher in digestible fiber than something like hay. And that's why they're so attractive uh, for us to use in, in commercial concentrate horse feeds, because we can get a higher fiber content in the feed 
and still have the energy value, you know, the calories that, that we're trying to get into that feed. Uh, these can be used to replace a portion of the forage in the diet, um, aside, but the alfalfa pellets could, could theoretically replace all the forage, but beet pulp and soy hulls, I don't really recommend them being um, the sole source of, of fiber for, for the horse. And it should complement the other fibers and the, the other forages in the diet. And there's some other less common super fibers. Uh, there's citrus pulp and there's almond hulls and fruit pumice and then copra, which is basically coconut meal. So after the coconut oil has been extracted, it's what's left. Uh, there's all actually quite good fiber sources for the horse. Each has their own little perk. Then there's also oat hulls, which is a halfway decent fiber source, but it tends to be a little bit high in indigestible fiber source, uh, indigestible fiber. And then there's rice hulls, which are high, uh, high in indigestible fiber. Uh, so Maria Pass asked, also asked, uh, can you uh, change the slide, please? Uh, she asked about the almond holes because I, I, like California is a huge producer of almonds. It's the largest producer of almonds. And so we have a lot of almond holes here. But I imagine that uh, in Chile, because since you do grow a lot of nuts, that almonds are probably pretty prominent there. So the almond hull uh, is, if you look at the picture and you see the little, um, the, the, the stone in the middle, it's the, that, that's, it's the, actually what was, was the fruit that was wrapped around um, the, the stone. Uh, and then the almond seed is inside that stone. So it's that, that soft, and if you, ever, if you touch one of these holes, they're kind of like rubbery. Um, there, there's been very little research done in horses on them. In fact, only, I can only find two published research studies uh, within the last um, 30 years. So, but uh, they, but neither of them found any like adverse of effects of, of the almond holes. So some of the advantage, you know, some of the good things with, with almond holes is they're high fiber. So uh, if you looked at the neutral detergent fiber, you'd see 20 to 50%. That's, um, that's a pretty good, decent amount of fiber and it's highly digestible. And so the energy value of, of, of the almond holes is thought to be similar to alfalfa. Uh, in the study done in 1992, they did, uh, they included 45% of the diet as almond holes. And the diet was only uh, alfalfa, oat hay, and almond holes. They, they, wasn't, they weren't being fed anything else. But um, at 45%, percent they didn't have any negative effects but i believe that th what they did is they dried those almond holes and ground them and then they were pelleted with the alfalfa and and the oat um so if uh if the uh oh in another study they uh, they looked at almond hulls and up at, in differing amounts and up to forty percent of the diet, and they found that the fecal butyrate, um, which like as I spoke earlier, that's an energy source for the um, intestinal cells, and uh, and and it all helps with gut maintain gut health. Uh, so and the the butyrate fecal butyrate was higher, uh, and when the the diet was high in, um, high in almond hulls. So and that might be a real plus. If you live in an area where almonds are grown, they're quite economical uh, and as a source of fiber. The, some of the drawbacks, um, lower in protein, 5% or less protein. So, uh, and when, um, uh, Clutter was looking at feeding um, the, the the more almond holes they gave in the diet, the less the protein in the diet was digestible. So it did influence the digestibility, protein digestibility in the diet. So if you're feeding uh, almond holes as a fiber source, it's a good idea to also have some sort of high quality protein in the diet. Uh, they are they are surprisingly high in sugar, 
uh, 20 to 30 to 48 percent, and that's on a dry matter basis. And but most of those, it's very little starch, but most of it is sugar, so water soluble carbohydrates. Uh, this you would think this would be a problem, but it really isn't because of the next things when next con um, palatability. So what Hansen found in this study that was just done uh, published this year was that uh, it took the horses a long time to eat the omitoles. When they did a test meal of 0.15% uh, body weight, um, it took the horses an average of 273 minutes to finish that quantity of almond holes. Um, and that compared to, it only took 48 minutes for the same amount of beet pulp to be consumed, and then uh, only 14 minutes for oats. So you can see they eat them really, really slowly. And so that's why that um, high sugar content is probably not a problem because uh, these almond holes had really low glycemic and insulinemic responses because they ate them so slowly, because only a small amount of the sugar is going into the digestive, the, the bloodstream at a time. Um, the, uh, uh, the, some of the things that people have commented or seen, um, some adverse things like li uh, lip sores from consuming almond holes, some colics, impactions, uh, can be some of the adverse reactions. And these are probably due to the high tannin uh, content of the almond hulls. But neither of these studies noted any of these problems. So the, uh, that's the down and dirty on almond hulls. But uh, just one thing to be careful of, uh, the, the leaves of the almond trees are not good for horses to eat. They are toxic. Okay, slide. Okay, so how much forage does a horse need in his diet? Well, the absolute minimum is about 1% of their body weight. So for a 500 kilogram horse, that would be about four kilograms of, of forage. Uh, the, that's an absolute, absolute minimum. And usually it means that the horse is getting something else in the diet other than uh, forage. So if the horse is on a forage only diet, I don't recommend them going below 1.5% body weight. That would be six kilograms of forage for a 400 kilogram horse. Uh, that unless the horse is um, severely obese and you're really, really struggling to get a horse to lose weight, then you can maybe drop down to 1.25. But I, I don't really like to see um, the intake be below 1.5. If you just let the horse decide, it, they would eat about 2% of their body weight. Okay, slide. Okay, so go ahead and hit the, the slide again because it should be an animation. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so the next um, energy source we're going to talk about is the non-structural carbohydrates. Okay, slide. Okay, so uh, as I explained earlier, the starches and sugars are the non-structural carbohydrates, the major um, starch source in the horse's diet are the cereal grains. They were, all, they were added into the diet uh, um, as an energy source, uh, and that's because they're more concentrated in energy than, than uh, forage, so you could feed less and get more calories into them. Um, the amount of starch varies between the different grains, like oats, it's 45%, um, around 45% barley. Uh, more 60% and then corn is the highest amount of starch. Uh, the start, the nice thing about starches is the horses love to eat them. They love to eat grains. So uh, it's an easy way to get more energy into the horse. The small intestine with the help of enzymes. And as I showed in the diagram and, and they're absorbed in the blood stream as, stream as glucose. So uh, slide please. So the, the one kind of um, caveat with, with feeding uh, grains, cereal grains, uh, is you want them digested in the small intestine. You don't want them going to the large intestine and being fermented. So uh, 
oat starch is in the small intestine have an easy time digesting oats, but the starch in barley and corn is more crystalline and harder for those enzymes. So what we found is that if you heat process the, the barley or the corn, it improves that um, small intestinal digestibility that it's easier for the enzymes to, to break them down. Uh, so heating would be things like steam rolling, steam flaking, micronizing, roasting. Uh, it doesn't seem like oat improves uh, uh, with processing. So it, like crimping is good, but it doesn't, it isn't absolutely necessary. Uh, and then uh, also if you have those grains in a concentrate feed, um, if they've been pelleted, pelleted or extruded, uh, those are heat processing that improve the starch digestibility. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this has got a lot of animation, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me see, okay, good, no, go back, back. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so, uh, so just looking at starch digestibility, the starch is a very complex uh, molecule and w when it's in the small intestine then the enzymes they break apart the the complex molecule and then eventually they break them down into um, glucose molecules so that they can pass into the blood bloodstream okay now you can hit it okay and so then once the uh, the the glucose gets towards the target cells it needs insulin to sort of open up the door in the cell so that the glucose can, can go in. So uh, glucose and insulin are very tightly linked in this way. Okay, slide. So if you looked at the digestion of something like oat starch, okay, so now you're gonna have to hit a lot of the <laughs> okay. animations. Okay, so, um, so if you had a kilogram of oat starch, uh, and it would go into the digestive tract and through the stomach and then go ahead. Uh, and then in the small intestines, about 80% would be absorbed um, as glucose. Go ahead. Uh, that would leave about 200 grams of oat starch going into the, to the colon. And then uh, there about 10% of that would be fermented by the microbes and then be absorbed as short chain fatty acids. And then, um, go ahead. And then about 10% of the oat starch would be leave the horse undigested. Okay, next slide. So if you looked at, oh, it's at 90% digestible. So um, if you looked at what was happening um, to blood glucose, you could see, go ahead and hit it. If, when, if you looked at time zero when you fed it, you would see a rise in, in blood glucose um, over a pretty much a two hour period. And then by four hours, it's, it's pretty much gone back down to normal. And the little bumps after the four hours are when it's fermenting in the, in the hind gut. So um, that's called the glycemic response. Okay, hit it. Uh, next slide. So our concentrate feeds, we can see the traditional feed. Um, go ahead and uh, so the traditional feed, if you looked at the percent, this pie graph is, is illustrating the percent of energy supplied by starch, and then the fiber is the yellow, and then the fat is the blue, and the sugars are, um, oh, go back. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, that the traditional feed, most, more than 50% of the energy is coming from starch. That's your typical. Um, and now we are a new generation of feeds. We're trying to um, incorporate more uh, more of the energy to be coming from fiber sources. And so then you can see that's the high fiber and then more of the energy coming from fat. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so if you did a glycemic response um, to a, uh, a high starch um, concentrate uh, and, and a high fiber concentrate, you could see the red line is the starch-based concentrate. You see that high glycemic response. So that's what's happening. Now, um, if you look at the fiber-based concentrate, you're not gonna see that huge glycemic response because there's not as much um, starch in there. And so uh, 
the, you're not going to have any these rises in glucose. So uh, the next slide. So that's what's happening with glucose. Well, you can see also the same things happening with insulin because there's glucose going in the bloodstream, insulin is being released. And so it rises and as it tucks the glucose into the cells, then it falls. But the fiber-based concentrates, you're not gonna see these rises in insulin because you're not seeing rises in glucose. Okay, next slide. So this is how we play with, with energy sources in the feeds um, when we're trying to decide which is the right feed for a certain type of horse. Um, so there's, uh, there's different things that, uh, um, are, uh, that affect the glycemic response. So it's not just the amount of starch uh, that's in the, in the um, meal. But it's also it, it's the it's the amount, but it's also the amount of of starch um, in the, that meal, and then um, whether that starch is digestible in, in the small intestine. So, like we see, if you had corn with not heat treated, you probably wouldn't see as much of a glycemic response as you would oats, uh, because the the starch digestibility of unheated corn is not that good. Okay, so next, okay, next one. Uh, so the other thing it affects it is how fast the horse consumes it. Now we saw that with the almond holes, uh, that when they consumed it really slowly, it affected the glycemic response. Um, okay, and I think there's one more. Yeah, so uh, the, because the peaks, are, if, you, if you have a big influx, of, I mean, if, if they eat quickly, they're going to have um, a quicker glycemic response, which will cause a quicker insulin response or a higher glycemic response and a higher insulin response. So, I mean, it's a little hard to see in these graphs, but there's almost like a, a division. When they fed different levels of starch, um, the lowest was 0.3 grams of starch per kilogram of body weight. And then the highest level was two grams per, um, of starch per kilogram of body weight. Mm -hmm. And when they looked at the glycemic response, those low levels of 0.3 grams and 0.8 grams, um, they didn't have near the glycemic response as the higher levels. And then if you looked at the insulin response in the lower graph, you can also see that there's not as much of an insulin response with those lower levels. Okay, so keep that in mind. And um, next slide. So this is where these um, recommendations for starch level in a diet um, are coming from. So some other studies they've looked at uh, that how much starch diet could a horse tolerate before too much ends up in the hind gut and, and disturbs the microbial balance? Well, that seems to be about those two grams per, of starch per kilogram of body weight. But um, for the best pre sequel starch digestion, uh, the, the recommendation is keeping the meal um, lower than one gram of starch per kilogram of body weight. Okay. It um, could be they affect the microbial pop population in the hindgut by um, making them more, more acidic. Uh, um, problems with the gastric function. Uh, high starch diets tend to, the horses have a higher risk of, of colic and a higher risk of laminitis. And then um, also an increased risk in uh, gastric ulcers and a higher risk of developing um, stereotypic behaviors. Okay. All right, go ahead the go hit it again. So the last energy source we're going to talk about is the fat. Okay, go ahead. Um, so fat as an energy source is uh, is is desirable in the horse um, because it's a concentrated source of energy. If you had one uh, cup, um, uh, one cup of oil, it would take three cups of oats to give the horse the same amount of calories. And fat is, oils are very highly digestible. They're more than 95% digestible, most of them. Animal fats are a little bit less. 
Uh, so they're really great for putting weight on a horse. They've also found that a fat can be a, a cool energy source, kind of a calm energy source, because when horses that were on a high fat diet um, were tested, they were less reactive to stimuli. So um, they're more reactive in a high starch diet than they are in a high fat diet. And when the horse is breaking down fat for uh, as an energy source, it produces less internal heat. So some of the, the benefits of, of high fat diets are you, you can get the calories into the horse without having to um, feed a lot of starch. Uh, so it's low glycemic. Um, the other thing that they've seen is that uh, when horses are accustomed to having fat in the diet, their metabolism will switch on the mechanism to utilize fat as a fuel source. Uh -oh. uh, and um, utilize, uh, uh, instead of, uh, instead of um, glucose so, and glycogen. So it's called glycogen sparing. And then, um, let's see. I, I lost the picture of Maria Pasta. Did you lose me? Uh, hi, hi, Katin. Uh, I think that Maria passed. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Oh, no. Maria Pass connection failed. So uh, I was the one with connection failed. Oh. So sorry to everyone. I don't feel so bad. <laughs> not... Technology is not on our side today. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, different types of, of fats are the oils and the oil seeds. So soybean, canola, corn, um, coconut, palm, flax seeds or flax oil, sunflower seeds, sunflower oil, something like chia. Also rice bran, not wheat bran, but rice, rice bran is about 20% fat. Okay, go ahead. I think there's some animations. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead and go ahead and hit. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I don't know what is going on now. <laughs> My gosh. I don't know what is going on. So sorry. You want me to try sharing my screen again? I'm going now. <sighs> well, while you're um, while you're trying to figure it out, just the the next slide would have been um, yeah. So the next one just shows that it's. Uh, but there's, yeah, slide 34. Yeah, so go ahead and go to the next slide. There is the animation. There they are, okay. <laughs> so let's go ahead, yes? Yeah, next slide, yeah. So when you feed, uh, um, when you feed a horse um, in a, a feed that's high in fat, uh, whether it's got some starch in it or not, the if it's high fat, it will, it will affect that glycemic response. So here's a comparison of a starch-based concentrate, um, the glycemic response, and then a high versus a high fat concentrate. As you can see, it moderates that glycemic response. Okay, next slide. And then you, we were talking about energy sources and you can feed fat for energy sources, but it also, um, you can feed it for its nutrients itself. So uh, horses, there's, um, horses have a dietary requirement for essential fatty acids. And uh, some of those essential fatty acids are the uh, um, uh, linoleic acid and uh, linolenic acid. So, um, these, these different types of fatty acids have different effects in the body. So the omega-6, which would be your linoleic 
acids are pro-inflammatory, and then your um, omega-3 fatty acids, which is your alpha-linolenic acid, um, tend to be less inflammatory. So, uh, uh, source, so it's a good idea to have um, uh, some sources of omega-3 in the diet, uh, particularly if you're trying to decrease inflammation in the body. And so good sources of these would be flaxseed and flax oil, chia, and, and fish oil. Okay, next slide. Some of the precautions when feeding fat, um, you know, well, it's calorie dense, so you don't want to feed too much or you might get a, a really fat horse. Uh, so you, uh, sh it should also be used in limited quantities. You can't make the whole diet consisting just of, of fat because the horse needs, still needs that fiber in the diet. And then um, uh, in order to burn fat, the, 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 there needs to be some glucose in the diet as well. So about 10% is, is of the total diet, that would be you know, including the forage and then whatever concentrate is, is sort of the max. Um, I mean, you can buy high fat uh, feeds on the diet, uh, on the market that are more than 10%. But again, this 10% is the total diet. Uh, if you're feeding oil, the recommendation is not to go over one milliliter of oil per kilogram of body weight per day. That's kind of another thing to measure. Um, what happens if you get too much fat in the diet is a lot of horses don't like that much oil and so they refuse to eat the food. Um, and if they do, they might get, uh, get diarrhea. Uh, what happens is their manure turns from the nice little formed road apples to uh, cow pies. Uh, so there's a, um, for the glycogen sparing effect, there's a bit of an ad adaptation time. It's probably around five weeks. Um, that's what research has shown. The other thing is um, in order to burn fat, that's a lot, there's actually oxidation going on in the body for, for it to be used as a fuel. And so the recommendation is to make sure that you have enough uh, antioxidant in the diet to sort of help with all that oxidation that's going on. So the recommendation is one to one and a half I use the vitamin E per milliliter of oil that, that just supplemental oil that you're giving the animal. Okay, slide. Okay, so um, as I said, protein can be used as an energy source, but it's not really the ideal energy source. So I'm just gonna cover it really quickly. Um, what the protein in the diet is, is to replace the proteins that are in the body. 80% of the horse's body, if you took out the fat and the um, water, is, is protein. I mean, the proteins are found everywhere, muscles, enzyme, hormones, immunoglobins, transport proteins. I mean, the, the proteins everywhere, hoof, hair. Uh, and the proteins are made up of amino, of amino acids, and there are some that are essential, which means that they have to be in the diet. Um, the ones that were most cognizant in, in horses are lysine uh, and threonine for growth, and methionine for, for hoof health and uh, coat health. Uh, and then the, uh, now it looks like uh, the branch chain amino acids may also be, have, a, have a role in uh, some of the muscle um, disorders that, uh, that um, is, are being studied now. Uh, so the non-essentials the body can make from, from um, proteins and, and amino acids that are um, already in the body. So go ahead, slide. Uh, the protein requirement, um, it kind of depends on the type of horse and stage of growth, the, uh, if it's a pregnant mare, if it's a working horse, somewhere around uh, three to four grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. Per day with lysine being about 0.8 to one gram of lysine per kilogram body weight per day. The requirements are highest um, during growth, uh, uh, third trimester pregnancy, and then after hard workouts. And that's because there, uh, there are body tissues being built and body tissues being rebuilt. Uh, when, when there's protein deficiency in the diet, it usually will affect muscle because the body will start breaking down muscle to support the other needs of the protein in the body. So you'll see poor muscle development or a loss of muscling, um, lack of energy, and then a lack of ability to, to concentrate and focus. 
Um, and when there's too much protein in the diet, the body is just well set to, um, to get rid of it. It uses part of it as an energy source. And then the urea is what's broken off of, um, but the nitrogen's broken off. And so the body will flush um, the, the nitrogen out through the kidneys. Okay, so next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, sometimes protein, uh, when you're looking at feed, um, a, a bag of feed, it, you have to remember that what's usually is on the bag is a percentage. And it's not an absolute amount. Uh, and so to illustrate it, this, I just um, calculated out what if you had a 10% protein feed and you're feeding two and a half kilograms, that means that there's 0.25 kilograms or 250 grams of protein in, the, in, in that meal. Um, that same feed, 10%, if you're feeding five kilos, then you're getting a, a half a kilogram of protein in that meal. So it's the same feed, but um, the quantity is what affects the amount of protein. So when you have an increase in protein needs, Say for example, a, um, a growing horse, usually the increase in protein needs can be met by increasing the amount of, of feed that you're giving the horse. Uh, there's a, um, a type of feed called the ration balancer. Uh, and these are rat called ration balancers because they're basically meant to, to balance out what might be missing in, in uh, the forage, but mostly just the protein, the vitamins and minerals. Um, but the, so uh, the, a ration balancer will have a, a lower feeding rate, recommended feeding rate. And so it would be about, um, again, one kilogram of a 25% protein ration balancer. I mean, you can see it's not supplying that much protein. So it's, it's um, a, a 250 grams of protein, which is the same as you'd be getting from 2.5 kilograms of, of a 10% protein feed. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now looking um, away from the nutrients that uh, are used for the um, for energy, uh, but these nutrients are still uh, absolutely essential in the body. So we have the minerals uh, and and vitamins. So the minerals minerals are inorganic elements, uh, and and they're needed by small in in small amounts by the body. Uh, the macro are needed in bigger quantities than the micro minerals. And then vitamins are, the difference is they are organic elements, all, but also needed in small amounts by the body. Okay. So minerals have to come from the diet. So we can't make the, the minerals around like they can reabsorb calcium from bone, and if it's needed somewhere else in the calcium. Uh, so, oops, some vitamins can be made um, uh, by the body, or um, I, I think we lost Maria Vaz. Kathleen? Sorry. Yeah, I see. Hey. <laughs> we lost Maria Vaz again. I'm again. sorry. I'm, I'm going to share the. Ah, oh, that's better, Igor. Yes, here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in what slide? Hello, Maestro. Yeah, going. And, oh, um, no, back up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, till you see the, the lake with the water. The lake with the water, yes. Yeah. No, sorry. There. Okay, so the, the next slide. Is that okay? So, next one. Yep. No, not yet. So some oh, of the vitamins okay. are. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. You can, but some of the vitamins, um, the microbes are making like the B vitamins for the horse. Uh, but things, the fat soluble vitamins are the ones that need to be um, in the diet, like vitamin A, vitamin D and um, vitamin E. Okay, go ahead. So 
the amount that's needed by the body, uh, see, this is like just a curve to sort of explain um, when we when we are trying to balance a diet, we're, we're trying to supply those optimal amounts. Uh, that we have here in this country a, a set of requirements um, put forth by the National National Research Council called the NRC, and those requirements there are right there, the line where it says requirement, and that would be just the minimal that would keep um, deficiency signs from a, occurring. But most of the time, um, the recommendations or the amounts that you're going to see in your concentrate fees that are meant to balance out they're gonna be in that optimal range. But then again, if you get too much of a good thing, then of course it becomes toxic. Okay, so next slide. So the minerals, there's macro minerals and micro minerals. Uh, macro just means the needed in larger quantities and micro in mi more minute quantities. Um, but the major ones that we of the max calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium chloride, sulfur, and then the micro, the major ones we look at in horse nutrition are iron, zinc, copper, manganese, iodine, cobalt, and selenium. Okay, next slide. So, what happens when there's when a horse eats something with the mineral in, in the food? Um, they are absorbed in the small intestine, most of them. Some of them have a second chance uh, in the large intestine, like phosphorus and sodium and chloride. But most of them, if they don't get absorbed in the small intestine, and they, then, then it's, it's all over for them. They're going to come out the other end. Uh, so what happens is when those minerals are there um, in the digestive tract, then they follow a concentration gradient called passive diffusion uh, to pass across um, uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, it's an interesting kind of relationship. The more abundant the mineral is in the, in the intestine, the lower the percentage that is that it's absorbed. Uh, and, no, and these minerals, none of them have like 100% absorption. Like a lot of them are less than 50% of what's present in the diet gets, actually gets absorbed. And then minerals also, if they're all mixed in together, they, oh, they might sorry. affect the absorption. Yeah, sorry. Can you go back for a second? Yes, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, and then once they're, they're into the bloodstream, then there's transport proteins that take those minerals all throughout the body to the target tissues. Uh, most, most of the minerals aren't stored ab above the requirement. Unless you're gonna, you consider like calcium and phosphorus that's in bone as a storage, it's not really a storage. It has a function there. Um, uh, so when when uh, the intakes are excessive, uh, the the body will start storing them, and so it can be a big problem. And two of the the worst ones for this are iron and and selenium. Okay, then next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, the absorption of uh, minerals from um, plant and prep products, um, plants uh, may not be enough to meet the requirement of the horse. And what I mean with this, I mean like in the, the forages and, uh, and just straight grains, the cereal grains, not a fortified feed because they're meant to balance out what might be low. And uh, for centuries, horses were not fed mineral supplements uh, and, and they survived uh, and didn't die of, well, some of them probably did die of deficiencies eventually, but uh, we're just finding that and either, our, it must be our forages and our cereal grains are just poorer in these um, elements than they used to be. Uh, and then that's why there's requirements. Uh, have, it's not that their requirement has gone up, but um, the forages are not able to meet those the requirements with the lower levels that are present nowadays. Okay, next slide. So 
so uh, what does the body do when it has too many um, uh, excess amount of minerals? Um, it can like stop absorbing, it just kind of shuts down absorption uh, and then increases the amount that's excreted in the feces. Uh, or something like sodium, it can, um, it's, it's regulated uh, and it can, it'll absorb the sodium, but then it'll just um, trigger um, excretion of this excess sodium. Or uh, things can also be excreted in the milk, something like iodine. So if you have an excessive amount of iodine in the mare's diet, it's gonna go into the milk and the poor foal will end up with that excess iodine. Okay, next slide. Uh, so you can have um, a, some of the ad adverse effects from either a, a toxicity or a, a deficiency. You can have a, an acute uh, intoxication, um, and these like this is when there's like a severe overdose of of a mineral. And an example of that would would be what happened um, in Florida with the polo horses. I don't know if you heard about that, but the uh, the horses were given a dose that was a thousand times um, the, what it was supposed to be. The, it was a, a supplement that somebody had um, put together and uh, um, for them had compounded it and they had mistaked uh, the zeros. And so the, these horses just fell over dead uh, when they went out to um, into, onto the polo field. So that would be an acute intoxication. But uh, the, um, if, if there's just a little bit of excess, like maybe too much iron in the diet, uh, the body can adapt some uh, and, um, and then uh, and change to try to adapt. And then the same thing happens if there's uh, not enough of it, if it's deficient. And an example of that would be uh, if there's a calcium deficiency, then instead of, um, the animal would just won't be able to grow. It just, it slows the growth because there's not enough calcium to build bone. Okay, next slide. So the amount of mineral um, in, in feedstuffs, uh, the forages and the cereal grains uh, kind of depends on, particularly the forages, depends on um, how much of the minerals are in the soil. Uh, the species of plant and then the stage of maturity of that plant and um, the harvesting conditions. Uh, and also the pH of the soil can influence which minerals the plants take up. So the lower pH, the plant's gonna take up uh, things like aluminum and um, some of the more harmful uh, minerals and then, uh, then in the neutral pHs. Okay, next slide. So the one mineral that um, we do find that horses have a, 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 a need for, um, and, and they will, they, if, they, if it's deficient in the diet, they will look for it, and that's salt. And salt is two minerals combined, sodium and chloride. Uh, the thing is if there is a if they don't have enough salt in the diet you'll you'll see them starting to look for it um in in places like you might see them eating dirt you might see them licking the the um iron railings or trying to lick your hands or licking sweat off of each other off of each other so um they do have um a need and they do have a desire to uh, to meet that need and so you can normally you can feed a horse free choice salt, and uh, then he'll, he'll meet the needs um, just on his own. But uh, there are a few horses that do get a salt obsession. And so um, if they're consuming more than four ounces of salt a day, then uh, they really need to, um, uh, that would be 120 grams. They, they need to be limited and they should have salt added to their feed. Uh, 30 to 60 grams a day. Go ahead. So the vitamins, there's two kinds of vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins and water-soluble vitamins. Uh, the fat-soluble, I mean, just by their names, they need to have fat in order to 
um, to uh, be um, in order to be absorbed into the body, and the water soluble, they don't. Okay, next slide. Oh, yeah. The so uh, vitamins are digest when they're when they're in the diet, um, and they enter into the intestine. They're absorbed in the small intestine. Um, the fat soluble vitamins all need to be absorbed in the small intestine. If they go beyond, then it's over for them. But the B vitamins, it's interesting, they can be absorbed in the small intestine, but they also can be absorbed in the large intestine because there's a lot of microbial, uh, um, uh, uh, um, the microbes, the B vitamins, and so those B vitamins um, can be used by the horse. Now, uh, something like vitamin C is interesting. The horse makes vitamin C from glucose in the liver. So it's, it's um, uh, another interesting vitamin. So uh, then with absorption, uh, what happens with water-soluble vitamins? Uh, they have active transporters that cross um, the intestinal wall into the bloodstream. Fat-soluble vitamins are are treated like a fat. And so they don't go into the bloodstream from the intestinal tract. They go into the lymph system and then the lymph system carries them to the liver. And then from the liver, they get distributed, uh, um, distributed on carrier proteins uh, through the, throughout the body to the target tissues. And so that's why fat solubles actually can, you can be, are stored by the body and you'll find them stored in the liver and the adipose tissue. Uh, the fat soluble vitamin, I mean, the water soluble vitamins, um, uh, they do are not stored. And so, uh, you need a steady supply, daily supply of, of the water soluble vitamins. Uh, when there's too much fat of the fat soluble vitamins stored up, it actually can start causing, um, problems in whatever organ, particularly like the liver, uh, and, um, be very toxic. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. Um, next slide. Thank you. Okay. The, the interesting thing about, um, about minerals and vitamins deficiencies and excesses is, is they're really not, not quite um, as obvious outwardly unless it's an acute toxicity. Uh, and if there's a deficiency, for example, of one of them, and um, the, the effects can be really subtle and it may be difficult to, to relate that, that problem. So if it's like, um, it's affecting, maybe it's a, a deficiency of, of zinc and it's affecting um, the, the bone in some way, and then, but the horse gets lame. So you'd never, you wouldn't relate it back to the zinc deficiency, the lameness, you probably would have think that the horse just injured himself. So they can be really, uh, um, so really sort of hard to, to pin down if there is uh, a, a, an excess or a deficiency. Um, blood analysis of most of the macro minerals and the vitamins um, aren't, aren't a good measure because the body's trying to regulate uh, the amount in the bloodstream homeostatically. And so there are a couple that do, you can do blood tests for like selenium um, and iodine uh, are, 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 and um, vitamin E is probably not too bad, but most of the other ones, it's really hard to use blood as an, um, a tool. So what we have to do then is uh, we do ration evaluations uh, to see if there's adequate supply of the minerals and vitamins. Okay, next slide. So here's an example of how we would do a ration evaluation. So this is um, the diet. This is a 500 kilogram horse that's in light work, and he's getting 1.5% uh, of his body weight in grass hay. And so in this graph, what we're looking at is uh, the percent of the requirement that the horse is getting of each of the different nutrients that are present in that grass hay. So uh, the kind of purplish line, that's 100% of the requirement. So what we're looking for is these bars to all reach or exceed that 100% that line. And go ahead and I hit the, it's got some animations, I think, yeah. So this, you, we can see in this forage only diet that um, the calories are 
are not adequate. They're below the requirement. Uh, the biggest thing are these minerals. So there's just, they're just not present in large enough amounts um, in the diet. And then um, I guess on this one more um, animation uh, is the vitamin E. So this typical diet. So that, that's where we see the holes in a forage only diet. Okay, next slide. So um, this is where the concentrate feeds come in. So what they're, the concentrate feed is trying to do is fill those gaps. So they get was low in energy, uh, low in minerals, and low in vitamins. So uh, the, 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 when you're trying to formulate a feed, you're going to look at things like um, uh, what, what, what kind of horse, what's he doing? Uh, um, and what kind of, I mean, what kind of horse do you want to make this feed for? What's typical levels of these different nutrients in the in that forage? Um, and then uh, you would uh, look at the requirements and then how much of that nutrient the forage contributes. And then um, uh, the, the difference would be what you're going to try to put into that feed. Okay, next slide. Um, next slide. Thank you. Hello. Ne next slide. Uh, yes, this one. Oh. oh there. Somebody there. <laughs> yes, hey, wait a minute, Caitlin. Yes. Uh, um, here I am. <laughs> the, you, you don't see it. You, you can see the. Ah, the yeah, okay. we, we saw it with a little bit of the late. Oh, okay. okay. Thank okay. you. There it is. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's an example. So if you had uh, zinc, you were looking at zinc and how much zinc you wanted to put, you, you uh, might calculate 30 grams. Um, there, the forage would have 30 grams per kilogram. And let's say that horse is eating 10 kilograms of that forage. So uh, if there's 30 grams in each kilogram, multiply that and you get 300 milligrams of zinc in that diet, that forage diet. But the requirement for that for zinc was 900 milligrams a day. So now you need another 600 um, zinc from, from the feed. Uh, so if your feed, um, if you knew that you wanted your feed to be uh, the recommended feeding rate being around three kilograms a day, then you know that you could put 200 milligrams per kilogram. And then with those three kilograms, that would supply that 600 milligrams of zinc that would be missing. Okay, um, slide. So uh, here's the, and so for, if, if you were trying to figure out in your own, um, with your own horse, uh, whether there's enough of a nutrient um, in the diet. Uh, this is how you could do it. So here we're going to look just at the zinc. Um, so in the zinc in the feed with the green thing, um, you can see that the zinc quantity is 110 milligrams per kilogram in that horse feed. And that horse is getting three kilograms of horse feed. So uh, 130 milligrams of zinc from the feed. And then if you looked at the zinc in the grass, and this was a hay analysis, and you could see that the zinc is 20 milligrams per kilogram dry matter. Um, and then, uh, so if the horse is getting seven and a half kilograms of, of fee of the, the um, pasture, then uh, that would give the horse 150 milligrams um, from the pasture. And so when you add the two, the 330 from the feed and then 150 from the grass and that would be a total of 480 milligrams and the requirement for a horse in moderate exercise 450. So you can see that this this feed would be um, with that forage is a good mix, a good match. Okay, next slide. So when you're balancing the diet of a horse, you, you, got, um, you have to take everything into consideration, not just the forage, but the forage and the grains and concentrates and supplements. And then all those things together will, 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 um, will balance the diet, meet the requirements. And so the different classes are growing, pregnancy, lactation, maintenance. 
Um, so the principles of a balanced diet, um, is it based it on forage? And you can go ahead to the next slide, that's fine. Um, for base it on forage, and then you would uh, balance what might be low or missing in the forage, uh, whether it's calories or other nutrients with your concentrate. So um, go ahead, next slide. So there's different options and depending on the needs of the horse, the type of horse. Okay, so go ahead and hit the first one. So if it's a horse that's in maintenance, it's just turned out, it's not doing any work, um, the forage is adequate in um, energy and protein, uh, then uh, you, can, you can balance the diet with just a mineral salt of some sort. And I usually recommend that it's a mineral salt designed for horses, not cattle, because uh, horses will have um, more copper than most other livestock uh, mineral salt supplements and copper and horses have higher copper requirement than most other livestock. So it's, it, it, that's one option. And then usually it's one of these mineral salt, the salt will um, control the amount the horse eats so he doesn't eat too much. Okay, go ahead, hit the animation. Um, so then the other option is a commercial concentrate. Uh, so it's like, as I just went through how they're designed to complement those inadequacies. Um, these, the commercial concentrate will help balance protein uh, and calories, as well as vitamins and minerals. But they have to be cognizant of the feeding rate because that's a target feeding range that the feed was made for. So if it's a horse that has a low caloric needs, then you're gonna need a low intake feed like a ration balancer. Okay, go ahead and hit it. Go ahead, um, next one. Ah, yes, we have a delay, so. Yeah, go ahead. V vitamins? Is Remember, that right? there's a little bit of, of delay. Oh, okay. Um, so, and uh, there we go. And these these work, um, they work okay uh, for the micro minerals and, uh, the, and the um, vitamins. They don't, work that well for the macro minerals like calcium and phosphorus. But they, they do complement, like you could just top off a commercial concentrate that you're feeding under the recommended feeding rate, you could top it off with a vitamin mineral supplement and that would be, um, the, and you can also use these vitamin mineral supplements for specific problems. For example, um, a high biotin feed uh, supplement for poor quality hooves. Okay, next. Okay, so you might have to hit the animation on this one. Okay, so just a reminder that um, concentrate feeds are different from just the straight oats or a straight grain. Um, they're great calorie sources. They're great calorie sources of starch. They have a little bit of fiber, a little bit of fat, but they are um, poor in the uh, vitamins and minerals. And so uh, if you are feeding hay and a straight grain of some sort, you're probably gonna need some type of balancer to um, supply those uh, micro and micro minerals or the vitamins that are missing or low in that forage. Okay. So this is an illustration. Again, here's the graph of, um, of our horse uh, and the, the green in the in each column is what of of the different nutrients like energy and protein and lysine, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium chloride, potassium, iodine, selenium, copper, zinc, manganese, vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E. What each of those is supplying from the the green is the what that forage is giving, and this horse is also getting um, some oats. And so yellow is what the oats would be supplying. So the oats will, will add some energy and it'll add some protein and some lysine. Not hardly any calcium, maybe some phosphorus and magnesium, but a little bit of these minerals and, and not, but not much. Okay, go ahead. I think there's an animation. So yeah, energy. 
again. Okay, next one. So the, uh, the concentrate feed um, is designed to fill those gaps in. So again, we're looking for 100, the line there at 100%. Go ahead, hit the animation. And, um, and then once again, and you can see that all of the nutrients are, well, including the selenium is just a little under, but it's really close to that 100%. So you basically got a balanced diet and that was done by feeding um, a concentrate feed rather than just straight oats. Okay. All right, next one. Um, the, just the easy keeper. Uh, again, they don't need those extra calories that from a like a typical concentrate feed. So they uh, they do really well with the ration balancer, which is the low low intake feed. Okay, next slide. Okay, so. Um, so this is the, an example of a ration balancer. See, it's not supplying a whole lot of energy, but it's balancing out those those minerals that would be low or or missing. And so it's doing it's doing what it needed with phosphorus and and um, calcium, and then um, but low energy and lots of minerals. Okay, next slide. Okay, go ahead, hit it again. Okay, so feeding strategies. Now, I, geez, I'm talking an awful lot, um, and I, I know it's getting late, but I have just some slides on each individual type of horse um, uh, that I can go through, and I'll try to go through them pretty quickly then. So uh, again, it's best to feed each horse as an individual because what works for one may not work for the other kind. Uh, so you're trying to meet those nutritional needs of that specific um, sport or that stage in life. Um, the idea is you're trying to maintain body condition. You don't want them getting too fat or too thin. Uh, and you can control the weight with a combination of exercise and what you're feeding them. Uh, and then make sure like those other nutrients, essential nutrients are being supplied. Um, and then you, then you address certain specific problems um, with additional nutritional support. Okay, next slide. So feeding the maintenance horse. Um, a maintenance horse is a horse that's like just hanging out. Uh, he's not ridden or maybe he's ridden a little bit, maybe an hour or so a week. That, that's still maintenance. And these horses don't usually have a very high calorie, uh, caloric requirement. But it kind of depends on the horse's metabolism because some thoroughbreds can be pretty, um, have pretty high metabolisms, might need more. But uh, the diet of the maintenance horse should be mostly forage. Uh, and, but again, you're going to want to make sure you, uh, you get those vitamins and minerals that might be missing or low in the forage. Uh, ration balancers really work well for this type of horse. Uh, and with these horses, you can, you can feed to the work, so to speak. That's fine. Um, uh, and that's just giving them a little extra energy when they've been working and, and but you know, keeping it minimal um, at times when they're not working. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so feeding the broodmare. Um, the interesting thing is when they're on like a maiden mare or an open mare, uh, their nutrient requirements are really higher than a, than a maintenance horse. They're about the same. They have pretty low calorie requirements, but they still need those essential nutrients. Uh, those vitamin minerals that might be low or missing in the forage. Um, they, if it's an easy keeping mare, you know, they do well on a ration balancer. But uh, it's, it's easy to just like turn the mare out and just, oh, she's got plenty of grass, she looks fat, she's fine. Uh, but those little nutrients, again, they're pretty sneaky and they, they're still required. And if you don't give them to the mare, she's, you know, she won't have the best of the building blocks for proper fetal growth um, in the horse. So in the first and second trimester, like in the first trimester, you're trying to make sure they don't gain too much weight. There's going to be a little bit of weight gain from the fetus, but you're not, you don't want them um, getting fat. 
Um, in mid gestation, they start to have increases in requirements for things like energy, protein, lysine, calcium, phosphorus. Um, so you may be having to feed them a little bit more. Uh, third trimester of pregnancy, this is when the fetus, um, it, there's exponential growth uh, in, in, the, in the fetus. And so uh, there's an increase in energy requirement. Uh, at that same time, the, the mare is giving that fetus uh, some, the supplies of, of, of the microminerals like uh, zinc and copper and manganese, and that, feed, that foal is going to use that once he's born, he's going to be dependent upon those liver supplies of those minerals to get him through the first um, part of his life when he's, uh, he's just on a milk-only diet, and those are pretty low in, in the mare's milk. So uh, if the mare doesn't have those minerals in their di her diet, she's going to take from her own body and give it to that, that um, fetus. So it's a good idea to make sure she has them in the diet so she's not robbing from her own herself. Um, so the feed, you want to give them a, this is about a time when they probably would want to give them a concentrate feed that's formulated specifically for the need. Um, so that she has adequate minerals and then protein as well as energy. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit on the ideal body condition about these, um, about a broodmare. Um, it, the, uh, the mares that have um, a moderate fleshy condition, um, body condition of five to seven on a scale of one to nine, so one being skinny and nine being um, obese. Uh, these mares in moderate condition, they, they've been found to cycle earlier in the year. They require fewer cycles per conception. They have higher pregnancy rates, and um, they're more likely to maintain their pregnancy than a thin mare. Uh, also, mares and the higher of the body condition scores, they, they tend to be more resilient to weight loss in the third trimester and better um, able to fight infections. Okay, slide. So, uh, well, what's, is it a problem if mares are overweight, um, pregnant mares? Uh, it, it would, there has been research that's shown that uh, mares that are obese in um, in the third, third trimester of pregnancy, that it can have an influence on the metabolic programming of that foal. Uh, and those foals are more, more likely to be obese as an adults or um, insulin resistant. So um, the other problems with obesity in, in a, a pregnant mare is because of the, all that um, uh, mesenteric fat, uh, the, it, it can uh, limit the size um, of the foal because there's a, a space constraint. And, and uh, there also can be problems at uh, parturition with dystocia. Uh, in a study where they fed mares 120% of their um, energy requirement, uh, they found that the IgG uh, concentrations were reduced in the colostrum. Now, it didn't affect, um, they didn't have a failure, um, failure of passive transfer, but uh, uh, it just shows that you can influence um, the colostrum quality uh, with, what the, with the nutrition of the mare. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then if a mare is too thin, this is also a problem um, that the mare will start digesting her own tissues to, to be able to, uh, to, to nourish that fetus. So she'll lose body fat, maybe some muscle um, uh, because of the protein in the muscle. And so if she's losing weight when she's pregnant, then it's gonna be even harder for her to maintain that body condition when she's lactating. Uh, some of the things that they've found in underweight mares um, that they have lower conception rates, uh, particularly mares that are losing weight um, have lower even lower conception rates. Uh, they also found that um, there's a longer inter interval from part um, partum to postpartum estrus uh, in thin mares, and um, the mares that have a body condition under five are more likely to skip a breeding season. Okay, next slide. 
Okay. So uh, now um, some uh, feeding the lactating mare. Uh, this is when the mare will have, um, I mean, the horse will have the highest en energy requirement of any type of horse. Uh, they, uh, the mare's going to give um, from her body if she doesn't have it in her diet to make that milk. So you can have some weight loss and some muscle loss um, going on if they don't have enough calories and protein in their diet. So you want to make sure they have a um, high calorie diet, high quality forage. It's one way to give them more calories and, and with, with less bulk. Um, so good leafy grass hay or alfalfa. Uh, and then a concentrate that's formulated for broodmare so that she gets those essential nutrients, the essential vitamins and minerals and proteins. Um, and then if that's, there's a certain point where she still needs more calories, you can always beef up the concentrate with more, with some super fibers like bee pulp or soy holes or some cereal grains or, or some um, oil. There are some mares like draft horse mares and uh, warm, some warm blood mares that seem to be super easy keepers and they don't even lose an ounce once they start lactating. Uh, so they're fine. They might be just fine on just a ration balancer. Uh, I would just um, just to make sure that she gets enough protein, the vitamins and minerals in the diet. Uh, so um, milk production is uh, it starts to really the quality starts to diminish, but you know after three months. So um, at about four months, that might be when you might start thinking about um, creek feeding on that bowl. Okay, next slide. So uh, as, you, as I said, there's a decline over time in the milk quality, but they found that high fat diets with a high quality protein source um, can actually slow that downward curve of, um, of the decrease in quality of the milk. Okay, next slide. Uh, so the nutrient needs of the lactating mare, like again, it, she'll take from her own body stores if, um, if, if it's not in the diet. Uh, a lactating mare can consume up to three and a half percent of her body weight per day. Uh, that would mean like, that a 500 kilogram mare might need of anywhere up to 18 kilograms of feed of forage, uh, feed um, in forage and concentrate. Uh, their energy requirement is a lot higher than the, the late gestation mare. So it's about, they need about 65% more protein, 44% more energy, about 55% more calcium, and 28% more phosphorus. Okay, next slide. Uh, so the just protein alone, um, the needs increased by 65% uh, from late gestation. So uh, it's, if the diet um, uh, has a 12% protein, I mean, that's probably fine because of the quantity of feed you're gonna be giving. Uh, the more feed you give, the more protein the mare will have in the diet. So uh, the, um, you don't wanna feed poor quality protein or an unbalanced amino acid profile because that'll affect um, her, her conversion of the proteins to milk proteins and affect the, the um, quality of the milk. Uh, and if there's not enough protein in the diet, it'll decrease milk production and you'll start to see the mus muscle loss in, in the mare. Okay, next slide. Um, feeding the growing horse. Uh, so these young animals, they not only have their own maintenance requirement, but they also need, they have their requirements for growth. Uh, so, um, these requirements will kind of be related to the body weight, the rate of gain, the body composition, and then the utilization rate for the body, um, building body tissues. So uh, you're going to be providing them with energy and nutrients um, just for moderate and consistent growth. You don't want to see growth spurts, big growth spurts, and you don't want them not having enough of these nutrients to grow. And one way to do that is to monitor their growth monthly, like but just weighing them monthly. And so you want to um, match the energy level um, to that the foal at the time. 
So you don't want them growing too fast. If they are, then you're gonna cut down the energy a little bit. If they're growing too slow, then you're gonna increase the energy. So if you're monitoring them monthly, then you can catch these things. Uh, not to forget that they need uh, those other nutrients, the minerals and vit vitamins, um, not only in quantity, but also in balance, particularly things like calcium and phosphorus in the right balance so that they can um, have uh, proper bone development. Okay, next slide. Um, just just to uh, quickly go through the the, um, the priorities of of those nutrients uh, that uh, that are supplied supplied in the diet. So the when the energy and the protein and the minerals and the vitamins will go first to meet the uh, maintenance requirements then second to bone growth, and then third to muscle development, and then of course, lastly, to um, putting on the fat deposits. Okay. Uh, so um, the requirements for these young growing horses, so uh, a high energy diet will increase the growth rate, but only up to their, their genetic potential which means that you, you can only, if, if the um, genes are programmed for the horse to be a certain size, you can't feed him to make him grow bigger. But you can underfeed him so that he doesn't meet his, his genetic potential if he doesn't get enough. Um, when there's excess uh, energy, then it'll be stored as fat. Um, it also can affect them mentally. They get a little more excitable. And it, it's also been found to be um, um, increase the risk of skeletal abnormalities. Uh, things that can slow growth um, are the changes in temperature, like it gets colder in the winter. Um, weaning, because then you get a change in nutrient intake. Uh, psychological stress, and then um, just decreases in dietary energy. The um, compensatory growth, like when the body um, has slowed growth and then rebounds uh, and with rapid growth. Um, this uh, it happens pretty commonly uh, when when these these foals go from winter into spring when there's low nutrient intakes and then you have the lush grass and so you'll see some compensatory growth. Um, so if there's like a short-term um, dietary restriction um, uh, it, and then they get um, a high uh, dietary energy amount, then like they, they'll get compensatory growth. But if that foal has um, had low dietary energy restriction for a long term, then you, you, they'll lose that ability, ability to do that compensatory growth. But there are some risks with compensatory growth, like it does increase the, the um, risk of development or orthopedic diseases. Okay, next slide. Protein in the, um, in the growing horse uh, is higher um, than the adult um, because the, the, uh, the horse is building body tissues and it needs, it needs the protein in order to, to um, create those tissues. Uh, for the typical diet, it would be somewhere between uh, four, yeah, 13 to 17% um, protein would be adequate for um, for growth. Uh, with these young growing horses, the, it's, the amino acid content of that protein is key. Uh, the, you, we have seen that horses don't grow well if there's not enough lysine um, and threonine in the diet. Um, also, um, the glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline are really important in bone and cartilage formation. Um, and there may be um, uh, other nutrients are needed uh, to supply the energy to support the increased rate of growth that's stimulated by the amino acid um, supply. Okay, next slide. Okay, so feeding the performance horse, um, weight management is, is key. You don't want them too heavy because that puts too much strain on their joints and, and their body. Um, you don't want them too thin because then they don't have the energy to do work. So uh, it's really important for for these for uh, to keep them in that four to 
ideal range for the working horse. Uh, then the other, other key is when we talked about different energy sources is trying to match that type of work um, uh, to the type of, of energy source. And some of the other considerations when you're trying to decide which energy sources to use to fuel the work uh, is uh, things like this, to the horse need to have a show quality coat, um, good high quality hooves, um, does the horse need to be calmer in temperament or does he need to be fiery in temperament? Uh, that, that will affect which energy source you use. And then horses with metabolic diseases like polysaccharide storage myopathy and equine metabolic syndrome and then um, Cushing's disease. So the next slide. Okay, so um, just addressing the, the fuels that the horse will be using for, for his work efforts. Um, the, the horse can use glucose from the circulating glucose and also the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in the muscle cell. Uh, the horse can use those short chain fatty acids uh, and right there in the muscle, um, muscle cells and then that would be uh, used for aerobic energy generation. Uh, or those they can go to the liver and get converted to glucose. And then the horse can use uh, uh, triglycerides uh, in the, um, from, that are stored in muscle and adipose tissue and then, uh, or ones that are circulating. And all of these, uh, these, these different fuel sources, that, that, and um, there's an animation, I think. Um, the end result uh, is, of course, to produce ATP. All of them are working together to go into the muscle cell to produce ATP, which uh, is muscular contraction. So if you looked at the 400, um, the little box at the top, uh, the 450 kilogram horse, oh, never mind, that's okay. So um, the, uh, oh, the, the largest supply of, of of fuel in, in the body is adipose. You can see 40,000 grams of triglyceride. Uh, uh, and um, there's a lot less um, muscle glycogen, glycogen being the glucose source. So it, between the muscle and the liver. Okay, now you can. So what's the best type of fuel that would work the best for the performance horse? Okay, I think this one has a lot of animation, so <laughs> bear with me. So, um, you have different kinds of work. So you have aerobic and anaerobic. Okay, so stop there for a sec. Um, so you have aerobic, uh, which is uh, the body is using oxygen to, in order to be able to fuel, um, to burn the fuel for work. And this is things like uh, walking, trotting, cantering uh, is aerobic types of work. And then you have anaerobic and doesn't need oxygen, um, but, it's, and it, but it needs, uses a quick burst of, of energy. So um, this is what the horse would be using for sprints and long gallops. So, okay, animation. So when we talk about um, the right fuel for the performance horse, trying to match to what kind of work the horse is doing, um, you can see anaerobic um, that uses glucose and glycogen. Okay, hit it again. And then the aerobic uses the fatty acids for a fuel. Okay, hit it again. Um, so uh, the, what's the source of, of glucose and glycogen, starches and sugars, and then the, the source of the fatty acids, like our fibers and fats. And so if you have a horse that's doing anaerobic splints and long gallops, they're going to need more starch and sugar in their diet than a, a horse that's doing a lot of aerobic work, which would benefit from more fat and fiber in the diet. Okay, next slide. So if you're trying to, um, to match the type of exercise to the uh, energy source in the feed, if the horse's exercise is slow to moderate in, in, in intensity, then uh, a high fiber or high fat diet really uh, is probably the best way to fuel that kind of, of, of work. If the um, work effort is moderate to intense, then you want a combination of all of those uh, energy sources. So you want some energy coming from starch, some from fiber, and some from fat. So a nice balance of all those. And then when the horse is working uh, in, intensely, um, then you're going to probably lean more 
to more starch in the diet, um, even though you can have some fat and some fiber. That's fine. Uh, we're good. You can, you can move on. Thanks. Okay. So um, now the, my last slide is just about some of the considerations uh, that uh, with feeding these the performance horses uh, during these strange strange times of lockdown. Um, there a lot of them are their workload is decreased. They're, they're, they don't have any competitions to go to, so they're not competing. Uh, so maybe they're still in training, but they're not training as hard. There's no races. It's just changed the workload which means that they have lower caloric needs because they're not working as hard. So you can do it um, a couple of ways. If you're trying to lower those, the calorie in the diet, you can either decrease the amount you're feeding, like decrease the concentrate, uh, maybe feed more forage because it's not as concentrated in calories. Uh, um, or you can change uh, to a lower calorie feed. So a higher fiber feed versus a higher starch feed or real high fat feed. Um, we're also, you know, you might see some temperament changes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, and these horses that they're used to moving more and they're using, used to getting more, uh, more turnout um, or more, uh, more work. And so they might need more turnout. But the other thing you can do is change their energy sources to get a lower starch and then get them on a higher fiber. Um, on a higher fat feed. Okay, thank you. Um, and so with that, uh, so I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I just want to mention that um, Kentucky Equine Research has an amazing library that has full of resources about topics in nutrition and also veterinary science. Uh, um, and that's available at KDR, KDR.com and you click on library or you could just go to kar.com slash library. Again, thank you very, very much. I appreciate um, your uh, hanging in there <laughs> with me. Muchas gracias, Kate. Thank you, Kathleen. And so sorry about all the technology problems that we have. We're pretty minor, so I'm not complaining. I, I told you about the last time when um, my computer froze, and so <laughs> no slides. But so this I went the, I went off so many times that uh, Igor took your presentation. I didn't have this problem before, but anyway, <laughs> thing that happened with technology and all the people connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, that's good. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't leave any time for questions. I. Um, uh, oh, we're good. Just we're good. We always okay. took some time. So, um, si hay alguien que quiere hacer preguntas, bienvenidas sean los que quieran levantar la mano o los que quieran um, hacerlo a través del chat. Están todos los chicos atentos a ver si ustedes necesitan hacer alguna pregunta. I, I had a question if I can stick it in. Sí, dale, dale. Ah, eh, eh, Dr. Grander, congratulations, an amazing talk. So, uh, so wide ranging, it's very difficult to, to, to expand on so many subjects. Um, but the, what, what I was wondering is, um, in, you, you, well, you talked quite a bit about, uh, you know, obese mares and insulin resistant mares and, and that kind of uh, subset of population. Um, and there's quite a bit of talk about the, you know, the, the inflammasome and how, how there's, uh, there's a chronic state of inflammation in, 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 associated to its resistance and obesity, uh, which I know that you also mentioned. Is there, where do you think research is going as far as, uh, as dieting is, do you think is there a role towards, uh, you know, um, um, antioxidants in the diet? Do you think they actually would make a difference in that sense? 
Mm, that's a very good question, uh, whether antioxidants would work. But I, I believe that um, most of the research is more, I mean, there's been some look at things like um, omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, uh, and its, it's, it's, its effect on insulin resistance. But um, the, the biggest thing I think we have to really worry about is just controlling the itself. Some sort of um, to for, for the, the problem. Did I answer your question? Yes. 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 Thank you. Tenemos unas manitos levantadas mientras esté viva, porque si me puede caer la conexión, le voy a dar la palabra al doctor Ignacio Coloma. Hello. Dale, Ignacio, dale. Hello, hello. Hi, Dr. Kathleen. My question is uh, about performance horse in, um, in example, thoroughbred. Uh, are you agree with the, with the change in the diet before uh, a big company, a big race uh, of uh, charging carbohydrates to, to improve or in, concentration in color as in human beings they do um I, the sound kind of went in and out so i'm not really sure if i got the whole question but uh i do um i'm not sure if in uh thoroughbred racing in colombia if you're allowed to use lasix but uh it is an issue i mean almost all the horses in this country are 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 getting um, are, are getting Lasix, and uh, what it does is it causes these horses to dehydrate, uh, to urinate a lot of body fluid out, um, and so then they're lighter when they get out on track and they run faster, and then the, so that they bleed less. But uh, it is a concern of mine um, that. Uh, with the effects of what what we're doing by dehydrating them and then making them work i mean that is a major concern and we at kentucky equine research we've done uh, a lot of work on um, looking at lasix and have seen uh what nutrients that it's causing the body to lose and uh um and uh if if you, the horse doesn't get those nutrients pretty quickly after the work effort uh, then it's really slow to recover um, recover those those losses. So uh, I, I I don't think that I um, I'd be able to change the the racehorse world. You know, just me standing up and screaming like. least now, like we have certain products that are that have been developed to help those horses after their work effort. To recover those nutrients that are lost, um, that are lost. Uh, so one um, one of horses that Kentucky Equine Research um, had developed a called um, race recovery. The other uh, problem I see with thoroughbred racing is they have um, the horses they have to withdraw uh, the forage and feed from them. Um, also, uh, uh, you know, at least four hours before they race. And uh, that just sets these animals up to more more problems with ulcers because of having an empty stomach and things like that. So I wish there was a way that these horses could still perform at their best and not have to go through these different uh, different things. But um, at this time, I, 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 uh, we don't really have any solutions to that yet. Um, we are looking at, uh, at Kentucky Equine Research, we're looking at um, a supplement, uh, well, it's feed uh, that the horse can uh, be given um, prior to like uh, the um, to to a work effort, like maybe when they're in training, that helps to 
it helps with goals, uh, with gastric ulcers. It helps um, neutralize the acids in the stomach that uh, can be a problem um, when they're in training. So you know, we're, we're, we're kind of punching out the little pieces of, of, the, of the whole um, thoroughbred racing uh, problems, but um, we still haven't found like major solutions yet. Did, did that answer your question, Ignacio? Okay, okay, it's very Doctor Coloma, ¿te puedes sí. mover a un lugar con un poquito mejor de conexión? Porque te escuchamos eso mal. Es lo que, eso es lo ahí. que he hecho toda la... Toda ahí, la ahí. Vez. Ahí, sí, sí, sí. Yeah. Yeah, that, ahí. But what's okay? What's okay, the, the answer, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, le voy a dar la palabra a iPhone, que no sé quién será, pero le voy a dar la palabra a iPhone. Uh, I think it's me, <laughs> Carolina Durán. Uh, hello, Carolina. Uh, this is uh, Carolina Durán from Valdivia. I'm, I'm working here at the university. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk, and it's, it's a lot of information in a short time, so I appreciate it. And I, I'm an internist, so I always, like, we lack a lot of nutrition, ap applied nutrition for equine uh, in general. I mean, there's a lot of production animals, then we kind of forget about horses, <laughs> and then we, we practice, and then we have to, to give advice on that. But the, you mentioned in your, your talk uh, specifically Filling the requirements of, of minerals, for example, vitamins, and it's you only realize it clinically when it's when it's too late or it's hard to know. Yeah. And and in your practice or experience, like which are your checkpoints that you're actually reaching what the table is telling you, or the label, I guess. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so. We I, we use a um, a set of requirements that has been put forth um, by the National Research Council. So that that that's the level that I that I'm looking for. At least that uh, Kentucky. We've done a lot of uh, balanced studies in particularly in minerals at Kentucky Equine Research, and uh, we have we found um, or have set our own set of nutrient requirements, which are, we consider them more optimal because um, they're, they're above what the National Research Council puts as the, um, the minimum, uh, minimal requirement. Uh, so that's why we call ours optimal. But those are what I, what we pretty much go on, like when in the graphs, what you're looking at, we look at um, the, the uh, age, size, weight, of the horse um, breed um, work, you know, whatever the horse is doing, and 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 then we have a com that computer program that was with the graphs. It can make an individual list of all the requirements for the different nutrients for that individual, taking all those things into consideration. Um, is that is that what you were asking? I'm not quite sure. Um, no, uh, a little more oriented on the the patient specifically. Let let's say I have a, a horse that is ain't doing right horse, and mm -hmm. and I do all my internal stuff, and I I can't quite find anything. And let's say chemistry panel and uh, blood work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and then let's say I think it's a deficiency and it's so hard to to measure all the micro elements etc. Um, yeah. How do you, I guess then you do a more precise analysis of the diet and what's actually there? Right, that's when that would be the first step is to look at all of the components of the diet. So mm -hmm. the forage, the feed, any supplements, and try. To um, and combine them and see um, if there's something lower missing in that uh, that type of, of, of situation. And, and the last question, sorry, and specifically on supplementing selenium, yeah. because we have here in the south a very selenium deficiency area. What, mm -hmm. which is your favorite 
way to supplement selenium? Um, so uh, my last visit, not my last visit, the, the penultimate visit to, to, <laughs> to I was at your, your, um, your hospital and I saw uh, one of those horses with, that was the selenium, suffering from selenium. I wasn't, I wasn't there yet, sorry. <laughs> So uh, yeah, and it was quite striking to to see you know the the effects of um, such severe selenium deficiency, and uh, the only thing that I could um, relate it to was the high volcanic soils like interfering with absorption of selenium. So um, yeah, um, personally, I, I I do like um, organic selenium selenium mm -hmm. yeast as as a supplement over. Uh, over the um, inorganic seleniums like selenium, um, sodium selenate. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so that, that's my personal uh, choice would be the organic. I know with those cases, you probably have to give them IV selenium um, to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, there's another question here. Uh, in many breeding farms, there is a practice of cutting the hay to prevent feed waste. I have also That those are uh, very good questions. So uh, the the cutting the hay because they're wasting. I, I understand economically when you're having a hay shortage that 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 might have to happen. Um, but uh, it is a good idea to in in those cases if you're going to be cutting hay, then you can um, you can use the pelleted hay as a supplement to um, the the long stem hay. Uh, the, and, and I like pelleted hay, but not as a hundred percent of the diet. I like to, um, it, I think it's good for horses to have, uh, long, some long stem hay to chew on just so they can get their chewing satisfaction that need to chew. Uh, my, one of my very first research projects, um, it, as an undergraduate was feeding a complete feed. It was complete and it was. Um, soy hulls, uh, soy hull pellets, and uh, the horses didn't get anything else but those soy hull pellets, and they turned into beavers. I don't know if you have beavers in, in Colombia, but I um, mean in um in Chile, but uh, they're they're the wood eating um, animals, and so they chewed all the fences, they chewed uh, anything in the barn that was wood. They just chewed, chew, 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 because they didn't have um, something to satisfy that need. So that's that's just the biggest drawback of a, of the pelleted hays. But um, they're gr I think they're great for complementing uh, some a long stem forage, particularly if you have a horse uh, that has a problem with um, their their teeth and they can't chew hay very well. Uh, they I like pelleted hay, um, pelleted hay uh, soaked for uh, you know, horses that have tooth problems or senior horses. Um, uh, and um, the particle size, I mean, when it comes to a horse that has a tooth problem and they can't break down the size of the hay anyway, it's good to have a small particle size of the hay. But I think, um, that when they don't have any source of other types of uh, long stem hay, then you um, you you can get uh, in problems um, with with these horses. There are plenty of horses in in this country in the Southwest that live on hay pellets. That's their only hay pellets and sage grass are their only uh, sources of forage. And um, colic and, and digestive problems aren't that common, but uh, it still is a risk. So that's why I, I like to see a little bit of long stem hay offered with the hay pellets. Um, 
Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, also, Hilary Bunei from Ecuador asks, if the diet is based on alfalfa pellets, do you worry about ulcers due to less saliva production? Okay, so um, there's going on there. There's been some research on alfalfa itself and, the, and probably the um, high calcium content and it found to reduce the risk of, of development of ulcers. So uh, if you're in alfalfa that are high um, with this in high in calcium, that maybe it, you wouldn't have as much risk of them developing um, the ulcers from less chewing as you would uh, say, for example, um, a hay pellet made from Bermuda grass or some other type of grass, grass pellet. Uh, yet, um, uh, again, uh, if you're going to be feeding uh, the, the alfalfa pellets, then it is nice to give them some sort of long stem hay that they do do some more chewing. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, we have, uh, we do have questions from, from Facebook Live. There is one, um, which would be the minimum level of tar start, sorry, in racehorse's diet in order to ensure a fast recovery of muscular glycogen? Okay, so uh, that would probably be on that um, scale of, of when I was talking about grams per, uh, grams of starch per kilogram of body weight. Uh, so it would be for the racehorse, it would be up there between that one and two um, grams of starch per kilogram body weight. Uh, again, you, didn't, you don't want to get above that two because then it starts interfering with the balance of the, um, of the microbes in the, in the hindgut. Okay, perfect. Um, another question. Uh, someone uh, would like to ask about the diet balance when the values are very variable within the forage and even in the hay. Oh, that's a good question. That is a good question. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people won't analyze it because they are, um, because they're changing. I mean, they're changing hay frequently and so like if they analyze the hay by the time they get the analysis back they have a different hay. So what we tend to do is take uh, take a, some averages uh, for the different types of forages and uh, and then you just make sure that you are you're not just meeting the, the requirement but you're exceeding the requirement so that you you have a little bit of a range um, uh, of, uh, to cover what what might be low in that forage, uh, the uh, the there there is a website called analytical.com, and a um, uh, one of their web pages is common feed profiles, and on that common feed profiles they have the averages of all of the samples of that they have analyzed for. The different types of forages, um, and different types, different like some different grains and some different byproducts, and uh, so I, I, if I don't have a hay analysis, I tend to fall back on on their data because they've done so many analyses, and I can see like where the ranges fall. They give you the average, and then they give you the range of each of the different nutrients, and it's a fabulous. Um, resource if you're if you're interested in trying to figure out uh, how to balance a diet and you don't have an analysis of, of that forage again that's equa analytical i think it's equa-analytical.com perfect thank you very much and another question from facebook live um which is your opinion uh, about the role of Cooper in the presentation of developmental orthopedic disease and which type of Cooper salt would you recommend to use as a supplement? Okay, so um, copper was one of those 
micronutrients that was researched, actually researched um, pretty well in, in New Zealand, and it, which is an area um, that is, has typically really low copper uh, forages. And they, um, with these, uh, they took a group of mares and they supplemented uh, half of them with copper. And I believe it was just copper sulfate. I don't believe they gave them a chelated uh, copper. But anyways, and then half of the mares didn't get supplemental copper. And then when the foals were born, they gave half of the foals the copper supplement from each group of mares and half didn't. And then, um, then uh, at the, um, six months of age, they euthanized the foals and they, and they looked at um, the development of orthopedies. They looked for OCDs, so osteochondrosis. And then they also looked at measured physitis and things um, uh, on these foals. And they found that when the mares were supplemented with copper, and it didn't matter whether the foal got copper uh, or not, but when the mares were supplemented in that last trimester of, of, of pregnancy with the copper, then there was a lower incidence of OCD and a lower incidence of physitis. So uh, that to me says copper, I mean, and it's not just, I'm sure you would see very similar things if you looked at some of those other micronutrients like zinc and manganese. But um, that means that that just illustrated the importance of feeding that broodmare um, copper. So uh, copper sulfate is absorbed fairly well by by uh, um, the horse, and uh, uh, but, uh, the, um, I prefer using some chelated. I mean, I I don't mind a mix of um, the inorganic and the chelated uh, copper. But um, uh, I uh, don't, what I don't like to do is just specifically target something like copper um, when, uh, when it comes time to trying to figure out how to balance out the diet. I like to make sure that there's a balance of all, all the nutrients, copper, zinc, co particularly co zinc, because copper and zinc need to be in the diet in a good relation, some um, uh, relationship. Uh, like the, there needs to be more zinc than copper, um, and then usually in a ratio of three, um, three to five parts zinc to one part copper, and that uh, assures proper absorption. And then, one of those that we have seen um, a relationship with uh, with uh, the developmental orthopedic diseases. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, also, the last question from Facebook um, Facebook Live, and uh, luego le damos la palabra a Beatriz Montero. Uh, the question says, uh, "Can I maintain the same proportion of, of fat when using a low quality forage?" Um, do you mean fat in the diet? I, I guess so. Yes. Um, yes. If you're using a low quality forage. Uh, the horse is not going to be getting as many calories, and so uh, you would you may have to uh, increase the amount of fat and then other nutrients and the uh, uh, energy sources in the diet in order to compensate for the lack of calories coming from the forage. Now, um, but just if you're, if you're using low quality forage, just make sure it's clean and you know not moldy and not dusty and dirty. But it just it may be more mature. But at least they have something in the diet. But uh, if you, it's because of the lower calories, you may have to compensate with more, adding more fat is what I'm, I think I'm trying to say. Perfect, that's clear. Eh, siguiente, eh, Beatriz, te, te habilita el micrófono. A ver, ahí sí. Ah. Ahí sí, tienes tu micrófono habilitado. Hola, Beatriz. Hola, hola. Hi, hi, Kathleen. Uh, congratulations and thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, 
My question is, uh, you mentioned that sport horses with intense energy requirements will need some fiber. So uh, my question is, how do you manage to compensate the gastric ulcers, abnormal behaviors, chew needs, colic, and all the things we know because of the low uh, fiber intake? And would you consider slow feeders as a solution of a uh, low quality um, hay as a solution? Okay, so with these sport horses, I would be looking for a higher quality um, forage than a low quality, just so they can get the, the calories in, in, and maybe they would get more calories, they could get more calories from forage and not be so dependent on the high concentrate, um, uh, the high concentrate horse diet. But if you have low quality forage, uh, then there's not much, I mean, if that's all you can get, then, um, then I understand. Um, so yes, slow feeders, I love slow feeders. Of the time of course is um, is occupied with with eating the thing about low quality forage and a slow feeder sometimes it's so coarse that the horse can't actually get the um the the the, the um they can't pull the the hay out of the feeder itself so you have to be careful of that um if uh, if you're putting a slow feeder in there and the horse is um Seems frustrated and, and but um, but it's not finishing it. Then you just want to be you need to make sure that they can actually pull pull the um, the forage out of it. Uh, so uh, the yes, I like the gas the slow feeders for um, just spread it out so that they're spending more time um, eating. So it, then it helps to decrease the risk of. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I like for the high performance horse is to try to give them um, a, a concentrate that is higher in fiber and higher in fat and um, maybe not quite as much starch. They need some starch, but maybe they could get by with less starch because that may also help um, with uh, reduce the risk of the development of, of ulcers because the high starch tends to um, influence prostaglandin gland and production and increase that risk. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. It's, it's, it's something, uh, we have a problem, well, almost of, uh, all of the uh, elite sport horses have, have the problem of the gastric ulcers and it's rare to see the slow feeders here in Chile. So just uh, question me which will be uh, a solution for these maybe slow feeders or another option as you uh, mentioned so thank you so much no te vayas Paula Kathleen as it, it has been a, a long <laughs> session but a good session again so sorry about the technical problems that we had, but it has been wonderful to have you here with all this information that could be last. In, in a good uh, talk with, for us. So thank you so much. Eh, gracias a todos los que han estado atentos a esta larga sesión que hemos tenido hoy día. El interés por las preguntas, tratamos de transmitir todas las preguntas que estaban, así que um, vamos a ir finalizando la sesión. Eh, decirle gracias a Kathleen nuevamente por colaborar siempre con HV. Y ya los invitamos para la sesión del próximo martes. Este jueves no nos reunimos. Es día, um, eh, it's a holiday in Chile, this uh -huh. Thursday. Eh, así que tenemos feriado. Nos vemos el próximo martes con el doctor Mariano Hernández, que nos va a hablar eh, un tema muy importante respecto de el bienestar, pero aplicado a la práctica equina. Así que nos despedimos todos. Thank you, Caitlin, again. Oh, you're welcome. What holiday is it Thursday? Bye. Uh, it's a national holiday for the... Um, 
for the Navy. Oh, okay. Well, yes. So thank you for it was a pleasure to visit Chile um, virtually <laughs> for, for this, the, this few hours that we were together. Anyway, it was thank good you to so see much. You again. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Dr. Coloma. <laughs> ya padre, se me fue la señal al final. <risa> pero alcanzaste a escuchar la respuesta, ¿cierto? Alcancé a escuchar salvo el remate ese, pero ahora ya... Ya, ya te quedó claro, ya, muy bien. Sí, lo, pero la pregunta mía escuché por caso. O sea, <risa> <que me> puede... <risa> bueno. bueno, ahí bueno. tendré que repetir. Bueno, adiós a todos, que estén bien. Nos Oye. vemos la próxima semana. Felicitaciones, ¿eh? muy buena. Muy buena. Gracias. Chao, chao. Chao. Bye, Kathleen. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.